Well, thank you so much, everyone. First of all, thank you to, to Harry for this invitation. Um, I think this is a great opportunity. I, I don't think modelers like myself get to come to come to meetings with so many stakeholders so often. So I really appreciate this opportunity. So what I'd like to do today, um, as Harry said, is to just give you all a flavor. I'm going to try to keep things really short, but just to give you all a flavor of the types of questions we answer with the mathematical modeling that we do. Um, most, some of our, most, much of our past work has been looking at cattle diseases, and um, swine are a little bit new to us, but I'll, I'll focus, of course, on, uh, um, on talking about mo modeling work for emerging swine diseases today. And I'd love to, um, you know, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end where I'd love to just hear your comments and questions and for us to get into a bit of a discussion. And um, I'll also mention that I'll be here for most of the afternoon, so if any of you have time later, I'd love to continue t uh, talking then. So, of course, no one in the room uh, needs to be convinced of the importance of uh, emerging diseases of agricultural uh, relevance. Uh, this is uh, some quotes from a report that came out of the White House Office of Science and Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, uh, which uh, sort of identified, of course, pests and pathogens to be one of the most pressing challenges. Uh, for agricultural preparedness moving forward. And it highlighted the need uh, for advances in both physical and life sciences for us to overcome those challenges. So mathematical modeling, the way um, I look at it, really sits at the interface of, of you know, taking advantage of both physical and life sciences and, and helping us answer questions of emerging diseases, both from a preparedness and surveillance perspective and also from a control perspective. And, uh, of course, emerging diseases of swine have certainly been on the forefront of our mind with PED, uh, which emerged in the United States in, in 2013. Um, we certainly heard quite a bit about it um, already this morning. Uh, but PD, of course, doesn't re represent the worst case scenario, right? There's, there was certainly, we've seen significant consequences due to PD, uh, both um, in terms of uh, swine mortality, uh, production costs, um, and so forth. But, Economically, it of course doesn't re represent the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario for the United States would of course be foot and mouth disease, which, uh, you know, is a worst case scenario because it spreads in multiple species. It is very, very hard to control, as we just heard. You know, even that temperature of 160 isn't quite sufficient to, to kill. So, so those standard methods that we rely on with other infections, with other pathogens, are just, don't just, don't cut it for foot and mouth disease. And of course, foot and mouth disease has spread with very, catastrophic consequences in other countries where the 2001 UK outbreak is the, the one we know best where um, it resulted in 8% of UK livestock farms being culled and uh, losses of over $4 billion to the, both the food chain as well as the agricultural industry. Um, so this is the, the, the big one that we keep in mind, but then there's also infections that have uh, zoonotic implications. So influenza with, uh, you know, the, the liberal use of the word swine flu in the 2009 uh, pandemic that we had uh, ended up having some very important economic consequences to the swine industry, right, with, with 27 countries blocking uh, trading with uh, the U.S. swine, the pork industry, um, and domestic confidence in pork uh, going down, demand going down, and certainly also a huge impact on hog futures. And of course, when it is a zoonosis, when it is a zoonotic uh, case, which uh, this may or may not have been, uh, there's, of course, a lot of consequences for public health. So, And in veterinary epidemiology, when we think about infectious disease risk and spread, we tend to focus on density, where the, 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 where the most farms are and where the most animals are uh, densely located and aggregated is where the highest risk is. And that is certainly true. But the argument that I'm going to uh, try to make is that it's movement and connectivity that really uh, make this problem much, much worse. And, and um, certainly Dr. Baker um, highlighted this um, in, in the way of, of transportation. And when I talk about livestock movement, swine movement, I'm thinking about both live animal movement as well as things like transportation and, and, and trailer movement. And I'll um, sort of flesh that out a little bit um, later. And so, so this map just shows us, uh, this is data from the USDA's ERS, uh, data of, of swine moving from state to state. It's, so it's only showing interstate movement. 
um, and ignoring the, the massive amount of intrastate movement that we have. Uh, the, the blue ends of the curves are sort of the incoming, so it's identifying the Midwest here as a, as a, as a sink, um, and the, the golden ends of those edges are, rec are um, representing um, sources of movement, and the thicker that line, the larger that movement. So this is just highlighting sort of how d geographically distributed and intensely connected the swine industry is in the U.S., and it is this movement, this connectivity that really takes the problem of infectious diseases from small local scales, from a small farm, to national scales um, and, and spreads it um, and, and makes it a, a problem at, you know, for the entire industry. And so it's really this connectivity um, that my research ends up focusing on. What we try to do is really explicitly build this connectivity into our models and using something called network models. And maybe looking at this map, you can already see what I mean by network model, um, to think about um, disease surveillance and preparedness and control. And, and we're, of course, not the first to, to realize that livestock movement is an important piece of the puzzle for infectious dis for emerging disease spread. Um, there's evidence that we have from lots of other situations. From the UK, we have both molecular and epidemiological evidence that says that um, livestock movement leads to higher prevalence in this case of uh, bovine TB, but this has certainly been found with the foot and mouth disease as well as um, other diseases. There's also um, something else that we've learned primarily from the from the foot and mouth disease outbreak is that when livestock movement is in, comes in the way of um, locations where you have a high animal throughput, so in the way of movement through markets, then that risk of infection gets amplified significantly. So this is a, um, a network map that is just showing movement of livestock within the UK as they move through markets. So um, in the UK in particular in 2001, there were infected uh, livestock, infected sheep in that case, that moved through a market and were sold again at a much larger market, this long town market, um, a, few, a week later. And as you can see, as demonstrated by all these edges connecting that market to farms, that market had the ability to distribute those animals, those infected animals, to a large number of premises. And before that, infection was even detected a week later, they had up to 80 infected premises. So um, this idea of, of high throughput through markets um, and just in general livestock connectivity um, through movements take really, really amplifies this problem. So where does disease modeling, where does mathematical modeling come into this? Um, so mathematical modeling really just provides us a quantitative and systematic way to take our assumptions about what is driving diseases and, and play those assumptions out. It allows us to consider what if scenarios, basically allows us to uh, test out these scenarios in a laboratory setting where the laboratory happens to be in a computer as opposed to in a traditional lab. And there's a variety of ways we can use modeling. Um, you can use it, we can use it during an epidemic to answer questions about the pathways that are driving um, disease spread, the means of disease spread. We can make predictions about future um, diseases. And based on those predictions, we can even think about control strategies, right? That's something we don't have the ability to do normally. About, you know, if we have two control strategies at hand, how do we assess their effectiveness except by doing a study that may sometimes be logistically, certainly, but sometimes be ethically challenging as well. Once a disease has become, has, you know, an epidemic has ended and a disease has become endemic or chronic um, in, a, in a population, modeling can help us uh, guide disease management issues to keep that disease at bay um, and, and prevent um, the, the large, a large number of cases. Um, and then finally, even before a disease has emerged, and certainly with things like foot and mouth disease, African swine fever, uh, classical swine fever, this is where we're um, uh, aiming our efforts, that even before disease has emerged, how do we take data, and you know, sort of, this is really evidence-based modeling here, um, and, and add those data to models to think about um, our surveillance efforts, you know, targeting our surveillance efforts to minimize resources and maximize effectiveness and generate preparedness plans um, with, those, with those in mind. So what I want to do is just give quick examples from each of these, um, each of these ways of doing modeling, um, examples from our own work um, of, of thinking about this, particularly in the swine industry. Um, 
and, and take advantage of modeling. So I want to start, of course, by thinking about PD. Um, and the question that we uh, want to ask is with respect to transmission. So again, no one in this room uh, needs an intro to PD, uh, but what I have here on this map is uh, lab-confirmed, cumulative lab-confirmed cases. This is data from, of course, the AASV. Um, this is slightly outdated data, so you won't see uh, many of the Western states lit up here as they were um, in Dr. Bigelow's uh, map. And so well, what we're seeing here is just cumulative number of cases with the darker colors showing larger um, number of cases compared to just swine inventory on the left map where, um, where that's in the 10,000, uh, where that's in the 1,000 head. Um, and all I want to highlight with this map here um, is that, you know, while, uh, while transmission does seem to be occurring primarily in neighboring states, there, even early on, we saw jumps to um, distant states. So, so we can already, even by just looking at a map of the cases, see evidence for long distance movement. So there's a few questions that that came to our mind when the data initially started coming out of this outbreak. Um, the primary one, uh, because we think connectivity is so important here, the primary question we were asking is swine movement responsible for propagation of this infection? And depending on the answer to that question, what are the other some of the other risk factors that are at play here? And then finally, um, what was what is the source of this infection? Um, within the United States, where did it start? Certainly there's um, speculation, and based on the, the cases that first started coming in, we have some ideas, but um, maybe <coughs> trying to use some of the modeling methods to get at that. And I just want to highlight that the answers to these questions are, of course, relevant for um, you know, so providing insight into surveillance and control and preparedness for this current outbreak, but one of our goals is to provide insight for this for future outbreaks so that we can um, prevent... Um, prevent these consequences again. So on that first question, um, sort of the, in terms of the role of swine, mo swine movement in PD spread, um, of course, as, as um, Dr. Baker said, there's, um, there was evidence coming out uh, from early studies that the spread was being driven um, by trailers, in particular that, that low et al. study, but also the studies um, that Dr. Baker talked about. Um, and many states, in fact, responded to this by limiting their uh, movement of swine coming into their states from uh, PD-infected uh, premises. But, you know, while, while we've had some evidence from small-scale studies, the mode of transmission really remained um, you know, something that was, that's been debated, um, till even recently, till certainly till last year while we were, um, doing this study. Um, and, and again, while the evidence was coming in from smaller scale studies, there weren't any large scale studies out there. So small scale studies certainly allow us to take into account the particulars of, um, that particular premise or that particular system. Um, but what a large scale study like the one I'll, I'll talk about in a second allows us to really take into account a much larger body of evidence and really look at the evidence that it, there is for a question like this, in this case, the transmission pathway. So what we did is um, took into account the movement data, live movement data uh, information that we had from the USDA, al along with the time series for cases. Um, again, the data from the, the lab confirmed data from the AASV on cases coming in, um, and combine those two to look at, um, you know, evidence for, uh, for the role of movement. So our hypothesis basically here was that if two states are closely connected, i.e. there's a lot of movement between those two states, then the disease dynamics in those two states will also be closely linked. And so what we did is we looked at similarities in the time series case data um, and looked at correlations with the movement between a pair of states. And that's the, the, the result is on the right here with the cross-correlation analysis. Um, and the links here show us um, you know, so how much evidence there is for movement driving the infection from one state to another with the, um, with the red colors. Uh, showing positive correlation and the blue colors, which we see very, very little of, um, showing negative correlations. Um, and overall, this was about a 0.4 correlation um, between the livestock movement, between the swine movement um, and the disease data. And so this tells, this gives us some um, evidence, certainly, of, um, of livestock movement, of swine movement playing a role in, um, 
in PD dynamic, PED dynamics, but we wanted to look at this a little bit further. So we um, did a secondary analysis. This was a um, sort of sophisticated regression-based analysis, is, is how I'll summarize it, um, where we really wanted to look at what kind of movement was driving things. So we looked in particular at three types of movement. We looked at a, a lot of different variables as well, which I won't get into, but the main thing I want to highlight here is the three types of movement, where we considered what if sort of the null model, what if we have no movement, versus if we consider undirected and directed movement. And the, the intuition behind the directed and undirected movement would be that if the directed movement model ended up being the most important, the most significant one, then that would tell us that it's live animal movement that's driving dynamics. Whereas if it's undirected, then it's just the movement of trucks and trailers moving back and forth that is driving dynamics. And so um, to fast forward a little, I can tell you that it is the undirected model that very, very clearly ends up being a better model here of what predicts PD cases. And so this tells us that there's a lot more evidence for trailer-based transmission as so confirming the smaller scale studies that have been done rather than live movement transmission. Now this ended up being quite an important finding because the conventional wisdom in modeling with respect to livestock movement is that its um, movements only matter up until slaughter. And so those, sla those movements of animals to slaughter are irrelevant, and we don't ever take those into account in our modeling studies. In the, in the past, we haven't. Certainly for foot and mouth disease, that's, that's been found to not be an important venue because the idea is that that is a dead end in terms of the, the transmission, so we can ignore them. But this study tells us that it's not just the, the movement of live animals that's important, but it's the actual trucks that are important as well and that are driving dynamics, and so we need to really be able to take all of those movements into account. Um, I'm going to go through this part a little bit quickly. Um, so the second question we had was what was the what might have been the source of entry into the U.S. Of course, the first cases were find, uh, found in Ohio and right here in Indiana, but the entry was unknown. So what we're trying to do here is look at arrival time. So this map just shows the first case of um, PD in a given uh, state. Um, starting from April 2013, um, at least up until on this map, till December 2013. And we're looking to see if the, the arrival times in a given state provide information on the origin. And the analysis here is very similar to what your cell phone regularly does to um, identify its location. So if, you're, if your uh, cell phone's trying to find a location, it gets tri its location gets triangulated with um, a set of three cell towers. And based on the amount of time that information takes to get from the cell tower to the phone and back, that cell tower is able to infer the location of your phone. Um, the phone's in your pocket. That's how it's, be, it's done. It's doing that every little bit. And so uh, using a very similar analysis, we've been looking at what the source might be um, of PDV entering the country. It turns out that that um, analysis isn't and doesn't end up being sufficient. The data um, if we just look at the epidemiological data, there's quite a bit of variation in, for example, how um, much time it would get, get, take for the infection to get from Indiana to Ohio. And so what we've done now is added um, data from genetic sequences of the virus, of PD virus, um, and are adding that on as a, as a secondary source of data to get at that information. Okay? Um, so let me give an example from control of... Um, so designing control strategies. I am moving back and forth here because there's a part of the, the slide missing here. Um, I can talk about it without uh, the slide being there. But the idea is um, that I wanted to bring up here is that, again, in response to the virus spreading and in, in response to this evidence that trailers might be um, propagating the infection, several, many states um, restricted the movement of animals to their states if they were coming from PD-infected farms. And those were self-imposed restrictions, but the point I wanted to make here is that if we used a, uh, if we used a modeling technique to design slightly more optimal restrictions, which can still be voluntary on the part of producers, um, but you know those restrictions would be designed in a bit more coordinated of a way we could sort of get more bang for our buck, um, so that you know the, the producers that are in, you know imposing those restrictions can still be protected, but then they, there's a larger effect, what we call a herd immunity effect of um, of those restrictions. So an example I want to quickly give 
is from um, our, some of our work with cattle, where we've looked at regionalization. So again, in the context of movement restrictions, instead of making blanket movement restrictions, this is certainly something that's been done in other countries. The UK has had some amount of success with this. Imposing movement restrictions for cattle or swine for anything, anything else in our country would be challenging. And so we've been thinking about regionalization methods. This is something, of course, that's um, already used in the context of bovine TB um, in states like Michigan. Um, but we've, what we've been doing is using an analysis from complex network theory called community structure analysis to try to figure out what might be an optimal regionalization that maximizes effectiveness, so control of infection in this case, while maximizing business continuity as well. So what we've done there is looked at movement of cattle in that case, so the, the network of cattle movement, uh, which again comes from data from the ERS. And you run this community structure analysis to identify an optimal set of regions in the United States, with the idea being that if we did need to impose movement restrictions, that those movement restrictions would still allow um, animals to move freely within a region, but just not cross region boundaries, which would, you know, to some degree allow business continuity, to a great degree allow business continuity while still reducing the degree, uh, the disease, excuse me. And we can do this for a variety of assumptions about how transmission is spreading, um, something, you know, take into account the particular transmission pathways of a given disease. And we can do this, again, so at, at with f more specific data. So on the previous slide, I was showing you data um, that just exists at the state level. But with the cattle industry, we actually have data, um, not excellent data, but some partial data at, the, at a county level as well. So we can repeat that analysis. But as, as you can see, the result of that analysis is very noisy and very unhelpful. Um, but what we can do is maybe... Um, apply additional constraints to that analysis that allow for um, improved feasibility and efficiency. And the reason I, I especially want to highlight that is because a given analysis, you know, just because it's been identified as optimal by a, by a model, doesn't mean that it'll be the most feasible analysis or will be, um, you know, easy to do. And so, if there are constraints, um, for example, in the, in the swine industry, it's a very just-in-time production system, right? So if there, there's constraints with regard to that, those constraints can be taken into account in a model like this and in an analysis like this to produce results that are still optimal and yet feasible. Okay. And then lastly, in just a slide or two, I just want to touch on the, the last end of um, the, the, the type of use of modeling that we can do is to assess the risk of emergence. So even before we have a disease outbreak um, break out in a population and before it even has a chance to become, um, uh, become uh, endemic, how can we design um, ways of surveillance that, even, that prevent that outbreak from ever happening? So again, um, as I was saying in the beginning, we, we tend to focus on swine density uh, when we think about uh, disease uh, risk and emergence. And hopefully, um, I've convinced you that you know swine movement is is another mass, major major feature that we need to take into account. And so, we'll, but what we're thinking about now is that it's not just live swine movement, as was shown to us by PD, but other networks of connectivity that also matter. So certainly, there's the connectivity of the United States to other countries through our, our trading partners, um, and so the importation of swine and swine products into the country that um, can certainly be a source of risk, as well as the shipment of pork products and animal feed throughout the country. Right? Um, again, this is a, which of these are going to be important transmission pathways depends on the particular disease we have in mind, but for many diseases, um, there's a whole host of these that matter. And the connectivity for each of these may very well be overlapping, um, but will certainly still be different. And so what we're trying to do is basically take data on each of those and combine them into um, a combined and sort of weighted network model um, re that represents um, swine disease um, uh, emergence risk, and then be able to use that model to identify hotspots in the country. Um, and and the, the point of identifying these hotspots is that they can be the targets of surveillance as well as preparedness plans. And so just 
to summarize, um, I've talked about the use, oh, I'm going forward the wrong way, talked about the use of network models and in, in general mathematical modeling to explicitly take into account connectivity um, to, you know, design, you know, sort of practical strategies for surveillance and, and other things. Um, in the context of PD, um, we've been looking at particular transmission pathways and sort of the evidence from large-scale surveillance data, the evidence for particular transmission pathways, and this is all a work in progress, so we'll continue to, to think about this. Um, but, but our goal here is that this is crucial um, in identifying both gaps in biosecurity and, and again, preventing um, future introductions of this disease and other diarrheal diseases. In the context of um, designing control strategy, our goal has been uh, to design optimal strategies um, that are both feasible and maximize um, business continuity. Again, we, we have a lot of work to do here, um, and it's really our collaborations with, um, with our business partners, industry partners, that um, really help us make sense of that end of things. And then finally, uh, for risk analysis, um, this is hopefully going to help us design better surveillance programs um, and preparedness programs. And um, we hope, you know, eventually mean that we have in increased access to um, our global trading partners, many of which um, have concerns about, about the, the risks um, involved in the U.S. with, with disease emergence. And one thing um, I haven't talked about, but I'll just briefly say, is that the great thing uh, we think um, about the data that goes into these models and about the analysis and results that come out is that it's those data and those models are very similar to what one might need if they were thinking about, um, about maximizing operational efficiency or management efficiency. And so um, these you know, some very similar analysis can, can you know, play dual, dual uh can have dual uses and um, and be relevant for um, you know sort of convincing trading partners um, of the you know the quality of our of our operations and management and be relevant for um, food safety assurance uh, assurance programs. So um, that's sort of another another benefit of that. So with that, let me just. Um, put an acknowledgement slide up thanking um, amazing members of my group, collaborators, including Dr. Snelson um, and uh, colleagues at the, the USDA and academic partners. 